You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good morning. Matthew chapter 17 is where we are in our study of God's Word today. If you would please turn there with me. Matthew chapter 17. As we were singing that final song, I was thinking about something that Martin Lloyd-Jones said concerning preaching. And of course, he he lived and he preached in a day... um, long before the kind of uh, technology experience that you and I live in every day. But he made the point that preaching involves the congregation, that there's something found in the corporate gathering of the Lord's church when the Word of God is opened and preached that, that is not found, for example, he would have said listening to a sermon on a cassette tape or <laughs> you know, listening in, in some other way because... The congregation is actually a witness uh, to any unbeliever in the room of the reality of the power of Christ to change lives. You know, we just sang an invitation. That's what we just did together. We just sang an invitation to come to Christ. And now this morning we open the Word of God together and we learn about the one uh, that we're inviting people to know. So I just want to remind you, um, you whether it's the morning service or the evening services, uh, it, it, it really isn't the same. Thank God for technology if we're sick or something like that, that we can still at home uh, take in the, the worship service and listen to the Word of God via that means. But there's nothing to compare with being here. Gather with God's people, opening the Word of God together. Matthew chapter 17 is where we are this morning. And this morning we're going to focus on verses 24 through 27. Matthew 17 I read beginning at verse 24. The Bible says this, Now when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect tolls or taxes? from their sons or from strangers. And when Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a stotter. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Lord, it is a joy to be with your church. It is a joy to gather together to sing your praises, to receive your word in the scripture readings, and then, Lord, especially as as your word stands at the very head of our worship, to open your word together and to hear it declared, heralded for the good of your church and for the salvation of sinners. Lord, I always am convicted and humbled and made to tremble a bit as I think about the many faces sitting out in front of me, the many lives represented in this room, each and every one alive now on this side of eternity, but headed toward an everlasting destiny. Who is sufficient for these things to declare your word to such a group? Uh, We are not, but I'm grateful that the sufficiency is found in Christ. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit is at work, and this means that you have ordained and that you are faithful to take the sword of the Spirit, making use of clay jar vessels and dealing with our hearts in a way that your church is edified, washed, corrected, directed, prepared, fortified, 
And at the same time, those who don't yet know your son, meet with the Son of God in the heralding of the gospel. Lord, would you work in our hearts today in a way that brings salvation and brings sanctification to those whom you've already saved. And we will be very careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that you alone are due because anything that lasts is your work, your work alone. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have sung this morning of the mercy of God, and we meet with mercies every morning, and we meet with His mercy on the pages of Scripture. Uh, one of the, the, the amazing demonstrations of the mercy of God is how He presents His Son to us in Scripture in so many different ways. Much of the ways that God presents His Son to us, much of the way is found in narrative, historical narrative. You move into the epistles and you find statements made about Jesus, but they're reaching back to what we know about Christ from the Gospels. What that means is before we learned about Jesus in words that were written down, men and women met with Jesus, the living Word, as He lived the things that we read about. Uh, what we read in the gospel accounts is not fiction. This is eyewitness testimony. John, I'm going to read from John here in just a moment. John, the other apostles, Matthew, uh, they, they saw Jesus. They heard Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They lived with Jesus. They saw his glory face to face. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then John wrote this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. By the way, he's talking about the gospel that he declares that he presents. But he's presenting it in personal terms because they met with the gospel in in the very one of whom the gospel speaks. They met with the gospel in Jesus himself, that which was from the, the, the beginning, the gospel, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so John is saying, I'm telling you about the one whom I saw, whom I heard, whom I walked with. I had contact with Him. I lived in His presence. They saw the glory of Christ every day. They saw it in the miraculous, and they saw it in the mundane. <laughs> they saw it in, in things that Jesus said and did that no one had ever seen before, and they saw it in an everyday way of life. So that, for example, we, we've learned this previously in Matthew, when, when you see a, a boy demonized, um, the demon casting the boy into the fire and into the water, he, he can't find deliverance. Even the disciples of Jesus due to their small faith, not able to cast the demon out. They bring the boy to Jesus. He cast the demon out. Luke says they marveled at the majesty of God, Luke 9, 43. You, you meet with the power of God and you marvel at the majesty of God. But now in our verses this morning, we're going to see you can marvel at the majesty of God, not just when you meet with the power of God, but when you meet with the Son of God, in an everyday kind of event, such as paying taxes. This morning, what we're going to think about is how a tax payment testified to Christ. How a tax payment testified to Christ. Can't get any more seemingly mundane than a tax payment. <laughs> um, something we don't look forward to, do we? tax season every year. It's pretty mundane, and yet in this seemingly mundane thing, we're going to see, once again, the mercy of God putting 
the glory of his son on display on the pages of scripture. They met with it face to face, not just in a powerful miracle such as demon deliverance, but also now in a tax payment. We meet with the glory of God's son, how a tax payment testified to Christ. I'm going to examine this this morning under three headings. I'm going to give them to you in advance and then I'll mention them as we come to them. Number one, a question about temple taxes. Number two, a lesson about royal sons. And then number three, a provision that demonstrated divine love. A question about temple taxes, a, play, a, a lesson about royal sons, and then a provision that demonstrated divine love. Notice, first of all, a question about temple taxes. Verse 24, now when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? And he said, yes. And when he came to the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, just pause there for a moment. By the way, this is the final mention of Capernaum in Matthew which needs to rest upon us for just a moment because you'll remember Capernaum is the place that Jesus chose as sort of the home base of his operations during his Galilean ministry. And Capernaum is rebuked because of the special privilege it has not benefited from. The Son of God for a time made you his home. What have you seen, Capernaum? What have you heard? And what have you done with what you've seen and heard? Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And so now for the final time, we read about Jesus in Capernaum. And once again, the glory of God in the, in the life of Jesus is going to be seen there. Because here, Jesus and Peter, they, they meet with a question about a temple tax. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? These would have been common people. These are not religious leaders asking for the tax, and these are not employees of Rome who are asking for the tax. This is not a civil tax. This is not the kind of, of tax that you and I pay to our government. That's not what this is. This is a temple tax. This is, a, a, this is money collected every year from Jewish people, and most Jewish people thought of this as a patriotic duty. They took this from the book of Exodus. Um, at the time of the census in the book of Exodus, there was a half shekel required from the Israelites for the support of the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 30, verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, a half, a half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras. Half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel. When you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. Well, what was collected at that time, at the time of the census, and was to be collected at the time of census, now the Jews, as they had done with so many other things, they turned it into something it was never designed to be. Now it was an annual tax in support of the temple. Scholars tell us that, that not every Jew thought this to be binding. The Sadducees, for example, opted out. They did not uh, participate. We are told that the Qumran community 
um, would participate once in a lifetime. But most Jews did see this as a matter of obedience to the law. They thought of this as submission to the law of Moses. Why did the tax collectors come to Peter instead of Jesus? We don't know. Maybe it was a matter of respect. They see Jesus as a rabbi, and maybe so as not to offend him, they approach one of his disciples and they ask, what about your teacher? Uh, Isn't he going to pay the tax? And the way that the question is phrased, it anticipates a positive answer. So this is not really an attack on Jesus. This is just a, a, a matter of, of course in the life of a Jew. This is something that was expected. He's not yet paid the tax and someone's got a question about it, someone who collects it. We might paraphrase it this way. He hasn't paid the tax, but he's not one to ignore it, correct? <laughs> he's not going to ignore the tax, is he? And Peter, feeling the need to defend Jesus, says yes. I don't know if the Lord appreciated that or not, that you you volunteer his tax payment. Yes, he's going to pay the tax. D.A. Carson, uh, commenting on this, said, the didrachma, literally two drachmas, was probably not a civil tax in support of Rome, but a Jewish tax levied on every male Jew between the ages of 20 and 50 in support of the temple and its services. The didrachma, worth one half a stater or shekel, was seldom minted at this time. And probably two people joined to pay a tetradrachma, four drachma coin or shekel. Originally, half a shekel was levied on each Jew at every census, Exodus 30, the money going to support the tabernacle. After the exile, one third of a shekel was gathered annually. In Jesus' day, the amount was two drachmas, half a shekel, annually. This is well attested in both Josephus and Mishnah. The imposition of this tax lacked the sanction of Roman law, but it was understood that the Jews would pay it. So where is the Lord's tax payment? Why has Jesus not paid the tax? It was an annual tax. Obviously, it was due. He had not paid it yet. Why not? We're not told that. But it would become an opportunity for Jesus to teach Peter why Jesus doesn't really owe the tax, which comes to our second point, that is a lesson about royal sons. You have a question about the temple tax, now you have a lesson about royal sons, verse 25. And he said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What that means is he didn't, Peter didn't get to ask a question about this. Jesus initiates the conversation. Is it possible that he overheard overheard the question to Peter? Possibly. Also, as you know, our Lord on many occasions demonstrates a supernatural kind of knowledge. And so maybe it was that, but he initiates the conversation. Spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect tolls or taxes from their sons or from strangers. And when Peter said, from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. Now, I want to underscore something because oftentimes we hear the scriptures wrongly. I just want to underscore the fact what Christ is going to teach here is not that God's people are not responsible to pay civil taxes. I think that's how we want to read this text. That's not what he's saying. This is a Jewish tax, but he's going to teach a lesson looking outside of just this Jewish situation to the world. He's going to answer the question by way of analogy. And so he has a question about the kings of the earth. Do they tax their own families? Do they tax their sons, kings, men who have authority over their realm? Think about kings, Peter. Do do they tax their own family? And Peter knows the answer to the question. 
He says, no, they, they, they tax strangers. They don't tax their own families. Kings provide for their sons. Well, using that analogy, the king of the temple is God. And the son of God, the one and only son of God is Jesus. In, in this mundane situation, Christ is giving an answer that is anything but mundane. <laughs> he is teaching a lesson about his own identity. Yet once again, we see the glory of Christ. In a tax payment, we see the glory of Christ. Kings don't tax royal sons. And Jesus is clearly implying something about himself, then the sons are exempt. However, that word however points back to the idea. He is exempt. Jesus is exempt. Why? Because he is God's son. Now, as you know, this this will become a question about Jesus as time goes on. This will come up at his trials. This will come up even as he is hanging on the cross. What is Jesus' attitude about the temple? What is his attitude about all that belongs with the temple, the, all the religious activity that belongs to it? What is his attitude about it? During his trials, Matthew 26, 59, now when the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? When he's hanging on the cross, Matthew 27, 37, and over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on on his right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. (laughs) For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Jesus said he would destroy the temple. And in three days rebuild. What's interesting about their picking up on that and implying and distorting what he said is that he made those statements at the very time that he was demonstrating zeal for the temple. Zeal for his father's house, you see. It is his father's house. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord of the temple. In fact, he is greater than the temple. And so in John 2 and in Matthew 21, you read about Jesus cleansing the temple, driving out the money changers, turning over their tables. And the disciples, thinking back on on what they witnessed on those days, they connect it with the Old Testament scriptures which teach that zeal for your house has consumed me. Jesus is not against the temple. Jesus is not against the temple activity. Jesus is God. He authored all that they are practicing if it's being practiced biblically. But he fulfills it all. He is the end of it all. So that he is not subject to a tax that goes to supply for his house. A house that exists to worship him. He's not subject to it. And by saying that, he is saying, I am the Son of God. And by extension, he might also be saying that it doesn't apply to his disciples either. What has happened to us now that the Lord has saved us? You realize we've been adopted 
into the very family of God. It's not just words, it's reality. We are now children of God. What an amazing thing that we should be called sons of God, and we are. God saved us by means of regeneration, a new birth. In that sense, the very nature of God has been imparted to the children of God. The new creation is in His image. But as a matter of legal course, in the sight of God, we have been adopted into His family. Joined His Son, heirs of all that His Son inherits. Christ is the one and only royal Son. He is the divine Son. But we now have been made by God's grace a royal priesthood, a kingdom. The king doesn't tax his own children. Matthew 12, 5, have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Jesus referring to himself. So if you and I are now, and the disciples at this time, if they are brothers by the grace of God, by salvation, of the Son of the King, who is himself the King of kings and the Lord of lords, if you now belong to a new era a new covenant that's going to be ratified in the blood of the king himself, does such a tax apply to you? And after the death of Jesus and the burial of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, the temple won't matter, the physical temple on the earth. The veil is torn in two when Jesus dies on the cross. The sacrifices, the priesthood, all the types and shadows on display in the organization and the rites of the temple, they all come to an end because Christ fulfills it all. I want to ask you a question, Peter. From whom do the kings of the earth collect tolls or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? And when Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. They come asking, is your master going to pay the tax? Peter says, yes. Jesus wants Peter to know, I don't owe the tax. (laughs) I don't owe the tax. And perhaps he was also saying, and neither do you. But that leads us to the third thing we see. And that is a provision that demonstrates divine love. Verse 27, however, even though I I don't owe the tax, perhaps he's saying neither do you, however, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, You will find a stotter. Take that and give it to them from me and you. Christ has taught a lesson by way of analogy. The lesson is true, but he's still going to make a choice that is counter to the lesson. He's going to make a choice despite the truth he's just taught. However, he says, Though I don't owe it, we're going to pay it. Peter, I want you to go fishing. By the way, isn't it interesting? The one man who preserves this account for us was a tax collector, Matthew. And the way that the Lord chooses to pay the tax involves a fisherman in fishing just always amazing and ironic how the Lord weaves His lessons through our lives in a way that we connect with them. He says, I want you to throw in a hook. Akistron is the word. Only place in the New Testament where you find it. 
You find men in the New Testament fishing with nets from boats, from the shore, but always with nets. Peter is sent out with a line and a hook. And he's told what's going to happen. The first fish you take up, I want you to open his mouth. And you're going to find a tetradrachma coin. A four drachmas coin. A shekel. And I want you to go and I want you to give it to the collectors for me and for you. What is this? This is divine love on display. And I would also suggest to you it is majestic humility. People marvel at the majesty of God when they meet with God's power. What is equally marvelous is to witness God's love for people through His Son in a way that Jesus does not insist on the honor that He's due. He's willing to refuse the honor that He's due to love people. Let me point out three ways we see the love of God in what Jesus does. And I believe these three ways instruct His church. They instruct us living our lives in the midst of an unbelieving world. These are three ways that God's love ought to be on display through the servants of Christ, through the people of Christ. First of all, divine love avoids offense. Divine love avoids offense. Isn't this what Jesus says? So that we do not offend them, scandalize them, cause them to stumble is what it means. Jesus takes off the table what he knows could be a stumbling block for these collectors. The collection is not binding on him, but they don't recognize who he is. They don't know that he's the son of God. They see him as a teacher. They see him as a rabbi. And for a rabbi to just refuse to give the temple tax would be interpreted as disrespect regarding the temple and all that it involved. They're going to draw the wrong conclusions about the Lord's attitude if he doesn't pay the tax. And so he says, so as not to offend them, so as not to cause them to stumble, here's what we're going to do. When you move to the New Testament epistles, what do you find? You find this is what love does. It does not insist on its own way. Love does not insist on its own way. It doesn't insist on its rights. Would never harm a brother or sister over something that has no moral bearing. We've seen an increase in this, haven't we? We've seen an increase in our day. It's been, been several years now, but we've seen an increase, I believe, in young men especially who are reformed and glory in pleasures that they believe they are free to participate in. Namely, smoking cigars and drinking beer. They love it. Young, restless, reformed. This is how it started, but it is continued now just to your common everyday reformed guy. Does smoking a cigar damn a soul? Mr. Spurgeon hopes not. Of course, the answer is no. Does drinking a beer mean you don't love Jesus? Of course, the answer is no. But have we learned from the love of Jesus? And have we learned from the humility of Jesus? In fact, we're going to see this tonight. What is the very next lesson he teaches in Matthew 18? Look at Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you're converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore will, what? Humble himself. Humble himself as this child. He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness in the kingdom, known as a result of humility, and here is the Lord who does not owe this tax. But he's going to refuse himself, his rights, 
and pay the tax because he cares that he would not cause these collectors to stumble. I will set aside what I could do and do what I don't have to do because I care more about these people than I care about myself. And that same love and humility is on display in Christ all the way to the cross as he gives his life on the cross as an atonement for our lives. Came into the world and loved his own to the end. If the greatest, the king himself, will pay the tax to support the temple that he's the Lord of, that exists to worship him, in order to avoid offense, what kind of humility should characterize his servant? This is Philippians 2, isn't it? This is the humility that should be on display in all of us. So let me ask you, do you insist on your own way though it is potentially doing harm to someone else. I'm free. Okay, you're free. Free to love people. Free to put others before you, you see. There is freedom. Taste and see. This is what we just sang about. Well, it's a freedom the world doesn't understand. Freedom for the world is the right to do what I want. Freedom for the church is the ability to do what I should do. You care more about you than you care about people who might stumble over your example? You care more about you than the harm you're doing to somebody else? Will you love others enough to avoid offense? This is the love of Jesus. This is the love of God. It loves others before it loves itself. It counts others to be more important than itself. So that even where we have legitimate liberties, they must be exercised in a way that would never cause someone else to stumble. Must be exercised in a way that isn't selfish. Must be exercised in a way that what we're glorying in is Christ. The author of the freedoms, not the freedom itself. If you can see that, would you say amen? amen? Divine love avoids offense. Second, divine love upholds the truth. So Christ is going to avoid offense, but he's going to do it in a way, he does it in a way that doesn't in any way confuse people about what's still true. He is the Son of God. This is not a large tax. Okay, a half shekel, about two days' earnings. If you're going to pay for yourself and Peter, it's about four days' earnings. Jesus could have paid the tax in an ordinary way. But he chooses instead to supply for the tax in a supernatural way. Why? Because even as he lays aside his rights, he underscores that it is his right because he's the son of God. And so he provides in a way that Peter would never forget and in a way that we would never forget. What he makes unmistakable is that he is God's royal son. I want you to go throw a hook in. Fish is going to come up. First one open its mouth, there's our tax payment. People have said, this is interesting to me, people have said it's not unheard of for fish to have coins in their mouths. <laughs> this has happened before. I'll tell you what is unheard of. The first one you pull up, it's going to be in its mouth. And by the way, it's going to be the exact amount we need to pay our taxes. That's unheard of. Wouldn't you agree? So this is not explained naturally. This is explained supernaturally. And by providing supernaturally, Christ is loving in a way. And this is love. Listen, he's loving in a way that not only sets aside his rights 
avoids offense, but in a way that upholds the truth about himself at the same time. And I want you to remember that genuine love never sacrifices truth. Is, is our world confused about this or not? The idea that we love people by acting like the truth is not the truth. In fact, we, we are to love people in a way, the world would say, the worldly church would say, we need to love people in a way that would absolutely leave them confused about what the truth is. No, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for the sake of others, but I'm not willing to sacrifice the truth for the sake of others. So I can, I can lay aside my rights, but in a way that still makes clear what the truth is. This is going to be a real test for the church. It is right now, and it's going to increasingly be tested to be perceived as loving, are we willing to sacrifice truth? You'll be praised. You'll be applauded. You'll be a lot more popular. But you will have dishonored God. So be willing to spin and be spent on behalf of others, but do so in a way that never undermines the truth of God's Word. Divine love avoids offense. Divine love upholds the truth. Third, divine love provides for others. This is the final way that the love of Jesus is on display. He doesn't just pay for himself, he pays for Peter. Take, and, take that and give it to them for me and you. Christ is the royal son. Peter, by adoption, is a royal son, but he's also a servant of the royal son. And what he learns on this occasion is that when you, when you serve Jesus, Jesus meets your needs. When you belong to him, he meets the needs of his servants. It's not something Peter was owed, but it is something that the servants of God can expect because of the faithfulness of our Savior and what he has displayed in Scripture, put, made clear in Scripture about how He takes care of us. We don't have to walk through every passage. You know it's saturated. The New Testament is saturated with promises about how God takes care of His children. So much so that we're not to worry about such things as food and clothing and where we're going to live and how we're going to live and all the rest. Don't you know, God takes care of the birds of the air and the grass of the field, which is alive today and gone tomorrow, of how much more worth are you? Will he not take care of you, O oh, you of little faith? Is there any more blessed life than to serve Jesus and rest in his care? Not to have to take up your rights and live a life of defending yourself and exalting yourself. No, no, I, give, I gave my life to Christ. My life is in his hand. I just rest in him and serve him and he takes care of me. This is what Peter experiences in a way he'll never forget. What a Savior. What mercy. And once again, we see that God leaves human beings just like Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? No, you're going to be brought down to Hades because if, if others had seen and heard what you've seen and heard, I mean, Sodom would have repented long ago. You are without excuse. Well, you and I are without excuse. Because first, in his person, men met with God face to face. Then through the verbal testimony of eyewitnesses, we saw him, we heard him, we handled, we lived, we, we've, we've met with the glory of God in this person. Through that testimony, men were responsible. Through the miraculous it was undeniable. In mundane things matched with the miraculous, it is undeniable. And now it's all written down. And God preserved it through multiplied manuscripts so that here we are 2,000 years later and it's 
before our eyes. We are without excuse. What keeps you from this Jesus today? Interesting language in Exodus 30, isn't it? That the tax they were to pay at that census was to be an atonement for their life. An atonement for their life, lest a plague come upon them. You give this for your life. And though it had been distorted and now made an annual tax, if you read Exodus 30, this is a payment for your life. This is an atonement for your life. And Peter will not pay his own price. The one who didn't know the tax is going to pay the tax. And he's not going to just pay it for himself. He's going to pay it for his followers. He, Jesus, paid the atonement for Peter's life. And this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus died for sinners. What we deserve to pay, what we owed, would have been paid it finally in everlasting wrath. But the one who didn't know it, the one born of a virgin who lived a sinless life, who never committed one sin, paid the full price in his own body on a tree for all the sins of all those who will ever put their faith in him, and he paid it in full. There's not one ounce of that payment left to be paid. So that when you come to Jesus, you find he made the he made the atoning payment for your life, and He paid for it all, all your past sins, all your present sins, all your future sins, paid in full at the cross by the Savior. What keeps you from this Jesus who is set before our eyes in amazing, merciful ways in the supernatural and in the mundane? You meet with the glory in a tax payment. You meet with the glory of God in Him. What keeps you from him? Would you come to him today? Would you give your life to him today? Knowing that he gave his life for people just like you. And then for all of us who know him, who put our faith in him, are we following him? This is how Jesus invited people to himself. Come, follow me. Take up your cross. Follow me. Are we following him? Walking in his love? Clothed in his humility? So that we would not cause others to stumble? So that we will not sacrifice the truth? So that we don't just think about providing for ourselves, we think about caring for others? Are we walking in the love of of the Son of God. The church gathers for preaching. In a sense, the church preaches the message. We all sit here because Christ has had mercy upon us if you know Jesus. We sang about it earlier. Who are you singing to when you say, come and taste and see? But anyone sitting among us who has not yet met him, Come and discover, come and find that in Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, there is real freedom. The church would say. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for these mercies. On the pages of your holy word, Scene after scene after scene after scene where we have the privilege to witness the glory of your Son. On behalf of all of us who know him, thank you for having mercy upon us. Shining your light in our hearts to give us the knowledge of his glory, your glory in his face. You granted us repentance and faith. We have met the one who has had such mercy, such love towards sinners. 
But we are mindful that there are people with us who don't yet know him. And we ask together on their behalf right now that they would see, that they would turn, that they would embrace your son for life, that they would know the genuine forever freedom that is found in Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you.